Whether you're a chestnut farmer, a food lover, or simply curious about this versatile nut, Branching Out with United Chestnuts is your guide to a thriving chestnut community. So join us as we explore the many branches of the chestnut tree, uncover the untold stories, and branching out together towards a sustainable future. Welcome back to another episode of Branching Out, the podcast dedicated to all things chestnut. I'm your host, Melanie Jones, and today we have a truly distinguished guest with us. Joining us is Dr. Ron Revort, an assistant research professor at the University of Missouri and a trailblazer in the world of chestnut research. Not only is he a leading expert in his field, but he also serves as the visionary leader of the Chestnut Improvement Network. Get ready to delve into the latest insights and innovations in the chestnut industry as we pick Dr. Revort's brain. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Ron, for joining me today. I'm going to start with uh, this question. When someone looks at your LinkedIn profile, they see Ron Revord, PhD, with the title of Associate Research Professor and Lead Reader of Tree Nuts, which is super impressive. And of course, this is work you're doing at the University of Missouri Center for Agroforestry. And um, I was just wondering, what does a typical day look like for you? Uh, so, well, first I'll I'll just point out that uh, I'm an assistant research professor. So hopefully in about two years, reaching the level of associate. Um, but if uh, if I have a typo on my LinkedIn, maybe I need to go correct that. Uh, well, that 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 could have just been me making that assumption too, sure. because you're so so knowledgeable. Oh well, thanks. So a typical day, um, it really depends on the time of year. So you know. I'm, I'm a field breeder and we run field breeding programs here. So we're, our, our schedule is dictated by the, the seasonal calendar year. So in the springtime and really, really starting before bud break occurs in, in March, um, we're pretty heavily in the greenhouse. Uh, it's probably uh, around three days of my, my work week or in the, the greenhouse. Uh, assuming there's not a, an urgent deadline of some kind, which, which does happen. Uh, and then we move into the the spring, you know, phenology period. With we're collecting bud break data, we're we're out there quite frequently. We're communicating with partners that are collecting uh, bud break data. Like we have a, a project going on with uh, ba uh, Badger uh, Johnson in uh, Ohio now, collecting <clears throat> bud break time on a, a like 300 plant PQK population to do some genetic research on that and then we you know phase into pollination periods and that starts with black walnut and it continues you know it starts with back black walnut around the beginning of may and continues with chestnut you know well into june so that's like an all hands on deck kind of thing and it's a similar kind of atmosphere starting in a few weeks here for harvest season and that carries through to Field planting season, uh, which is, you know, anytime post-harvest, you know, sometime in November, we get all the nuts, like samples and seeds where they need to be. And we start evaluating nuts or start field planting basically until the ground freezes. So, you know, those are the, there, there are some periods in there when it's not so field intensive, uh, maybe four months out of the year. And then, then I'm at the, the computer more often, but it can feel like a, a push-pull a lot of the times between competing activities where you have a full plate of work in the field and a full plate of work at the computer. But so that's like a, a high level. But I, I try to uh, start like a typical day, regardless of field obligations, which is more, this is more of a, um, you know, a, a habit that I'd like to stay consistent with, but don't always do. Uh, it's like morning exercise for most people is morning writing. So it's one thing I picked up from my PhD advisor was to, you know, write daily and, you know, first thing makes it more uh, likely that you're going to actually accomplish that checkbox for the day. So whether it's a man manuscript we're working on or, or a grant, it usually starts with, with daily writing and then get distracted with the priorities of the day after that. Absolutely. Do you have a preference of being outside or inside? Yeah, I don't know if I have a, a preference. I like the, the balance of both. 
it's, you know, after you've been at the computer inside for, you know, a string of weeks, then it's really nice to be outside. But then like this year, especially after you've been outside for two months and it's been above 90 degrees, most of those days, <laughs> you're wanting to go focus on some, some papers that you want to get published. Fantastic. So it, <laughs> it is really nice to have both. And I know like it's nice to, um, I was speaking with my wife about this topic like a few weeks ago. And, you know, most people have to sit down for eight hours a day for work. And it, it is really nice that it's not the case here and you could stay active and actually do like a lot of exercise during the work day. If it's a field day, and, you know, maintain health. So that's, that's a really appealing side of the, the work. Yeah, I know. I've <clears throat> talked to a number of people that, that have chestnut orchards and when I say, what is your favorite thing about it? One of the key benefits that they enjoy is the ability to be outside, to be in nature and to get exercise. Yeah, so, um, good physically and mentally. Yeah, so I'm sure that there's a lot of listeners who aren't familiar with a, what a breeder of tree nuts is and you know what what's involved and what are the goals? Yeah, so really it's uh, applied genetic improvement of like cultivated forms of the, the crop. So, you know, there, there might be uh, cultivars available to growers or in a lot of cases, especially in the, the regions where there's, you know, this really rapidly growing chestnut or hazelnut interest, there aren't cultivars that have been developed in those specific regions. So when, you know, the seedling was selected and, and then moved to like a replicated trial, like all that work of selection and evaluation wasn't done in that geographic region where there's interested growers. And so what we are trying to do is um, take germplasm that's been curated over the past 20 years at the University of Missouri and this build out dedicated breeding programs here for the various tree nuts for cultivar release, um, foremost for our immediate stakeholders in our geography you know, the Missouri River Hills or the other soil types throughout Missouri that could support tree nut crops. But then also for, you know, the extended Midwest or even, you know, the Appalachian states to the degree we have partners in those areas that can help us trial materials. So usually there's a couple objectives based on the currently available cultivars where you're trying to make some kind of improvement or you're trying to recombine traits that exist not in one given single cultivar, but across a series of cultivars into, you know, one new release. And so a lot of breeding is based on complementary hybridization in these like forced outcrossing. So not self-pollinating, like highly heterozygous, uh, so genetically diverse clonal crops. So where you're basically trying to just find complementary uh, breeding parents where you have, uh, let's say if you have seven traits of interest, three of them are in parent A and the other four are in parent B, and you're trying to, in, in the most streamlined way possible, which ends up being more, far more than one cross, get all seven of those traits uh, into one offspring. And so you might find complementary pairs throughout your founder breeding base to develop your, your crossing scheme. Uh, wow. and you carry forward your pedigree lines. I guess there's one thing that I try to share with anyone who's like uh, new master students, especially when they're trying to understand like what a breeding program is, is that there's two phases for a lot of these breeding programs for a lot of these crops that I've just described. So they're, they're clonal, they're highly diverse and they're outcrossing. There's a progeny evaluation phase where you make new offspring from those complementary hybridizations and you, you plant out you know, large numbers per family, but also per G breeding generation where you might have you know, 20 to 50 crosses for, you know, annually. And the breeding generation might be 3,000 to 10,000 seedlings annually. Each wow. cross with its own respective objectives for, you know, complementary pairing. So that's the first phase. And you try to, as quickly as possible, find defects in your seedlings and get down to a representable set of that, say, 10,000 seedlings that you could actually take a deeper dive that don't have an obvious visual defect. Deeper dive, wow. meaning taking more phenotypic data. And then you might find your 3% from that 3,000 or 5% that you rotate to the second phase of the breeding program, which would be 
replicated evaluation. So where you make clones of that or those selections and put them in an experimental design, usually a randomized complete block design where there's one clone per replication. And then you would plant standards in there. So the existing available cultivars or the parents of those breeding selections. And you would basically get uh, experimental data to say that your new breeding selections are actually better in some respect. Maybe that's a comprehensive respect, or maybe it's uh, one aspect, like a disease resistance, or it uh, has a more preferred phenology, like harvest time or late bud break. And then with that data, you actually have the basis for claiming that you have a, a new release that's worthy of uh, a grower planting. So that's what a breeding program is. And you might in that replicated trial phase have an environmental component where you have that same experiment in different areas. Uh, if you think there could be transferability of your, your material to those areas with some you know, reasonable assumptions met, but the performance might be different. Yeah, it, it really is a, quite a, a pairing of science, creativity, and data, isn't it? Like attention to detail for sure. And, and effort. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's just a, a, lot of, a lot of physical work, and it's definitely a, a team activity just because there ends up being a lot of plant materials to manage one breeding program. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, this is a good segue. Um, you know, at United Chestnuts, we are breeding members in the Chestnut Improvement Network. So explain the goal of that program. What, what, what are you trying to achieve long term? So the last question was, as long as uh, you were able to hold the thread, which is a lot of information, uh, was a good tee up for this. So the Chestnut Improvement Network is a participatory breeding program, and it is that for at least two reasons. One is there's a long legacy of germplasm exchange in a very um, decentralized way in the eastern half of the U.S. for uh, chestnut. Uh, and there, there hasn't been a dedicated breeding program. Uh, and is like the second point to serve those growers. And so growers have taken it upon themselves to plant seedlings from diverse sources or where other grower association members like those in the Chestnut Growers for America or the Northern Nut Growers Association have, have found interesting things or uh, seed from, you know, cultivars that have been described in, in past literature. And there's been this really beautiful community that's done some, you know, on-farm on farm breeding. And, you know, maybe everybody is kind of communicating, but a lot of coordination and material is just, uh, it's sort of ad hoc. It's yeah. uh, what people are interested in and diversifying based on new named selections from, you know, grower X and grower Y. And then, you know, about the evaluation component is maybe um, at the discretion of the respective growers, if they do any evaluation at all, maybe they just, you know, observe as they harvest or as they manage their orchard. So that that is all great. And it's moved the the needle forward quite a bit in the chestnut community. And now you've seen both, both from an outreach perspective and just having new material out there perspective, because now there's this, you know, huge germplasm base of a lot of seedlings from these really great founder parents, a lot, which we have in our repository here. So it is a really nice genetic improvement aspect, but it would be, um, in, in my opinion, even better if you had the coordination of an institutional breeding program that was uh, providing structure to all of these uh, decentralized individual efforts. And so that's the the role that the Chestnut Improvement Network would basically fill. So the with the same kind of intentionality of developing crossing schemes or applying selection criteria to offspring, making selections, uh, or even having coordination in all those activities between dozens of farms. So that, that same kind of structure that we would have in our Black Walnut Breeding Program in Central Missouri or our uh, Hazelnut Breeding Program in Central Missouri, we could have throughout the eastern half of the United States with chestnut. And so that would be how we bring structure to this sort of ongoing 
thing that's already happening where there are seedlings being planted for commercial orchards. But then yes. there's the second half of the breeding scheme, right? What's the replicated trials, right? So that's the, what I just, just described, like seedlings and orchards and applying selection criteria to find improvements is the first half of the breeding scheme. So it's a progeny evaluation. But then we actually have to figure out once we have interesting selections, what do we do with them? And right now it's, it's sort of like a free for all. It's like, let's name them and let's sell the seed and let's do it all over again. But it would be nice if we had the second phase of a typical breeding program built within this ecosystem of growers too, where there's replicated trials that these selections then go through. So we could figure out which ones are actually worthy to release to growers uh, and with respect to region. So, and that actually might be something that we touch on a little bit later as far as where we hope to see the, the breeding program in a, in a certain period of time. Yeah, so but, so if I if I say at our United Chestnuts we have five different seedling types from Chestnut Improvement Network, and they're going into the ground, and then your mm -hmm. team will say, okay, let's take a look at you know when are they producing nuts, what kind of pests are you know maybe attacking them, et cetera. Like, what would a typical farm like ours benefit? Yeah. So what we'll end up doing is applying. So if we have breeding objectives, we would then have some kind of specificity with those per um, maternal family, because in your case, they're open pollinated from our mm -hmm. repository. And then we would manage the implementation of those selection criteria over time. So say the first 10, 10 years or so. And one of the first ones will be, especially in your environment, bud break time, because we mm -hmm. really need for, for so if we're doing this like multi-location participatory breeding program, inherently one of our objectives is adaptation to these respective environments. And a really important generalized adaptation for yield stability is late leafing to avoid frost damage. And like, I think you know, there are, there's quite a bit of frost damage in, in the Northern Kentucky and Ohio region this year. We had a one in 15 year frost the last time we had a frost of this severity in central Missouri was in 2007. It was a, an anomaly to say the least, but we lost most of our crop in our chestnut repository this year. So one of the things that we would do first is, is like apply selection criteria like bud break because we could reduce the um, population of seedlings that are under evaluation to a, a manageable degree pretty effectively and early in the life of those seedlings. So with a trait like that, we can go from evaluating 250 seedlings to maybe 100 or 125 seedlings. And it's something that's easy to do. You know, it's a, a visual assessment. Uh, we can go there, uh, you know, once or twice early in the life of the, the planting. We don't have to defer, you know, 15 years or, you know, say seven, eight years to get nut size. But then after that, we'll we'll go through and look at other phenological traits, uh, like is the burr, and so hopefully ones that are more binary so that we could further reduce down that population size to something that's more like, you know, 15% or, you know, yes. that's just a, a, an artificial number where we could actually then look at like nut quality aspects, which would be a more detailed labor intensive uh, endeavor. And so moving forward, do you see that your team would reach out to us and others that have bought product from you all to say, okay, we're going to evaluate this now. This is what we need you to do. Like, tell us a little bit about the benefits of a new grower saying, well, I'm going to get my trees from Ron. Yeah. And team. So the first benefit is a lot of growers do lean towards chestnut, at least in, in my experience, because they do like being a part of this like longstanding research community, like our apply, let's say applied research community that's been happening with um, genetic improvement on farm. And so a benefit to being a part of the network is to be like tap into a more like structured environment to do that. Um, and so we definitely will be communicating with people that have, you know, CIN progeny on farm to strategically go through for evaluations. There's actually no obligation for the 
the grower to to do any evaluations. The only obligation on your end is to to manage the planting as you would commercial orchard, which is is what it is for you. So we would communicate kind of what our our plans are for applying selection criteria and um, like where selections are being made. So if our as we're reducing our focus from the 250 to you know lesser numbers, that would be be communicated back and, and the rationale. But in an ideal uh, world, we would have research technicians that were employed by the, the breeding program coming out to facilitate this, uh, like data collection. Or yeah. we could set up some some passive means for data collection, like uh, imaging. Okay. Yeah. No, that's, I, I think that's yeah. great because, I mean, obviously, you, you and your, your team have such a wealth of knowledge about this. And there's a lot of people that are interested in becoming, like you said, part of this chestnut community that don't have the level of education that really would benefit them and all of us. Um, and so it, it, to me, it's like bringing together a population of growers to the, the intellect that you have on, on the topic. Yeah, the, the biggest thing is um, just thinking about a strategy of, of priority traits that we want in you know, the next generation of cultivars, which we hope will be clonal. I hope, mm -hmm. you know, 20 years from now, we could have clonal orchards. But yeah, you you could apply. If you have to go through and evaluate in a breeding program, thousands of seedlings, you have to do it tactfully. And um, some of my breeding member uh, mentors would say, Is it, if there's a defect or a trait that you don't want, you don't need to look at the tree anymore. Like you need to move on to the remaining, you know, thousands that you you have at your disposal for, for breeding uh, ones would you, that would don't you, have those defects. Would you so, ever say, hey guys, United Chestnuts, why don't you cut down this tree that you bought because we found defects in it? Not necessarily. So a defect from a breeding standpoint doesn't necessarily mean that it's irrelevant from a producing a marketable crop standpoint. It might just mean that, uh, well, from a, a breeding parent perspective or a Hold of our release perspective, this plant would just be non-ideal in this one or more or more ways. Like its leafing time is early, so it, it it's going to be vulnerable to frost. You know, thirty yeah. percent more over the course of a decade, but it might have really nice nuts that you could take to market. One thing that we could offer or suggest as a trade-off is, especially if selections were made early in the life, is that the the tree could get topped and field grafted if mm -hmm. that was of interest to the grower. And okay. there's a lot of varying, I'd say varying interest in, in grafted trees. But another important thing to clarify is that when we're making a recommendation to growers, especially if they're in a really ideal environment, soil and, and climate like the Missouri River Hills, we recommend grafted trees. So your, your orchard production is going to be higher. And this is, there, there will be conflicting opinions out, out there. Mm -hmm. it's a, I know that. <laughs> um, it's a hot topic, but we have, you know, grafted cultivar trials here that are consistent and, and still, you know, bearing quite a bit. And we presented on that, that data at the July conference. But if, you, if you're really interested in doing uh, like breeding activities, uh, or if you just want to go with seedlings, because that's that's what you feel is the best choice for you. Or if you're in a non-ideal environment where issues with graft graft unions over time uh, become more exacerbated, where you have you know failed trees more frequently because I think because it's a more stressful environment for chestnuts in general, then then seedlings are are viable options. But we we do try to caveat that you should kind of know what's best for you based on your conditions. And, and in really ideal environments, we do recommend grafted trees. In 2021, the University of Missouri's Center for Agroforestry and Chestnut Growers established the Chestnut Improvement Network. This network formalizes on-farm evaluation and selection efforts as the beginning of a new decentralized participatory breeding program. The network is designed to advance the next generation of progeny for cultivation in seedling orchards so that growers are participating throughout the breeding process. For information, visit centerforagroforestry.org. And now, 
back to branching out. If we were on a journey of research on the chestnut tree, how far into the journey are we, or does it go on indefinitely? I think that there's a long arc here, and we haven't, uh, we're, it's always hard to say when you're you're in it. It's maybe a little bit egocentric to say that we're at the, the top of the arc, but I, I think that we're, I don't think we're on the backside of it by any means. I, I think that we're in the like, really early side, like we're starting to see like rapid growth with, with new acreage being put in and, and interest generated and a lot of new capital coming to Chestnut like now. So I yeah. think that we're still on the, the near side of of rapid growth and we're just seeing the early signs of it. And really as far as like the science of Chestnut, I mean, that's that's early too. There's been a lot of applied applied work that's really moved the needle forward. But from a scientific perspective, you know, we don't even know how to clone these plants. Yeah. Like, well, um, the species well. We don't even know like simple questions about why graphs might be working well or not working well. So there's there's a whole wealth of information to explore. And and again, like that's with like like with the the Chestnut Improvement Network, there's really been no dedicated breeding program to date. And so I mean that's our primary motivator for establishing the program. Um, yes. I I think that there's a a promising future ahead and we definitely we know less than we don't know. Exactly. Yeah. You know, part of my goal really um, excites me is this idea of generating interest and demand of the product for, from the consumer side. I just think that, you know, nine out of 10 Americans aren't really familiar with the chestnut as a true food source in the United States. So I, I'm, I'm passionate about that. But the other part is that um, because we sell trees also, we talk to so many people that are very interested in wanting to have a small farm and get into the industry and to learn. And so that was that's one of the reasons we started this podcast is just to say, let's be transparent and open up the information so these people know where to turn. Because if we want to raise demand of the product, we need to have more product. And to have more product, we need to have more, more farms, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so... I guess you kind of agree that we we really are in the infant stages of doing that here in the U.S. Yeah, yeah most definitely. And I mean, don't quote me because it's off memory, but I think there was some somewhere around a 50 to 60 percent growth in the number of individual orchards or, or growers between 2012 and 17 in the wow. census. In, yes. In the let's just say greater Midwest, if that paints. So, so I mean, we, we like sure see it. States. We yeah. just say the last month, two new folks have teams have come to us and, you know, yeah. saying we really want to get into this. We have old farmland that's perfect to turn into something different. And so, yes, we want to sell them trees, but I, I feel it's right to have the best trees to sell them, which is yeah. why we're, we're talking to you about some other things, but, yeah. um, well, so I, I agree with um, Greg when he re responds to those statements. So mm -hmm. best uh, best doesn't exist. So there is no best. And I should say Greg Miller. Yes. Um, Route 9, Route 9 he, Empire Chestnuts. Right. Because we, we, we don't, there's a lot we don't know. So that, and that's why, t because there's a lot we don't know, like moving forward with plantings in more of an organized, systematic way where there's heritage tracking there's like even balances of families in certain locations with good plot maps that are recorded with the management system that's why that's all very important but another side of why there's no best or um, how to address the question of is there's there there is no best is diversity is really important as well so there are things that we do know like there are some like excellent cultivars based on replicated data here or observations from, you know, the, the longstanding experts on chestnut, like, like Greg Miller. And then those tend to produce decent offspring too. Like those traits are heritable. Like, like Ching is a great example um, or, or sleeping giant or Mossbarger from our data. Um, the others too, like Gideon is excellent, but 
again, still we we don't know so much that diversity is really important to to plant on the farm. So I wouldn't really I wouldn't ever recommend uh, grow or plant all like their their farm all to one population or you know one seedling family. Absolutely. Well, this is a good time to ask. There's a lot of interest in the PQK population. Mm -hmm. Tell us why that is. I don't know why there's interest in that, but I, I know that why PQK would be something that has value to plant, especially if you want a large volume of seed with known parentage. And this is like the general principle with seed orchards in general, right? So if you got Ching from us or any, any cult of our family, there could be 10 potential pollen parents if it came from our cult, of, that seed nut came from our cult of our trial. There could be 50 potential pollen parents if it came from our repository. Yeah. Um, if it came from our cultivar trial, that's that's great. There's, you know, decent cultivars in there. Uh, so it's not like a poor gene pool. Our repository is a great gene pool for breeding because you have a great amount of diversity and we really don't know what parent combinations seem to have good combining ability. Because um, you, you do find out a lot, even outside of looking at phenotypes, you know, if you're making complementary pairs, you could find a lot, you could find good combining ability amongst a wider so selection of parents, uh, just from an, an exploratory perspective. But if you get Ching or Sleeping Giant Seed from a grafted clone of it in an orchard with a bunch of other seedlings that mm -hmm. have varying levels of quality, the resulting seeds that you get are going to have a higher level of like defects in them basically yes or like varying levels of quality so the the range in um quality is not going to be as tight of, of offspring performance and in, in theory it's not going to be as tight of a bell curve you're probably going to have a, a wider distribution you you might have some unique good good ones that are on like the good end of that that tail of that bell curve but you're you're going to have a flatter bell curve in theory, and you're going to have a longer tail on the other end too. Okay. Um, so PQK is even on the the other side of the the spectrum with this regard, in that there are only two pollen parents of Ching, and they're both decent cultivars. So you have basically three three or four combinations of full sibling families within that population. So Ching by peach, ching by core, and peach by core, and reciprocals, obviously, but you basically are planting a series of full siblings uh, if you plant from PQK. And the, the final point being uh, ching is a more prominently grafted tree in that orchard, so there's going to be more um, of the, the ching offspring in that pool of, of seed. And that would be uh, if we were going to recommend a cultivar to plant over any other, uh, Ching would be at the, the top. So that's just a, a high quality um, pool of seedling material if you want to go the seed orchard route. And it can be produced in high volume because it's a, a full orchard. So there's a, you know, a large volume of seed available compared to you know, a few ramets of this really nice selection over here and a few ramets of you know, this really nice selection over there. Um, okay. So especially during, you know, really rapid growth, you know, and there being large demand on seed um, because there's a lot of new orchards going in, the PQK population has that important role to play. Okay. Didn't y'all almost sell out of, of seeds this year? Yeah. I mean, there's been like like we've mentioned, a lot of growth and demand. So, and especially with the frost damage, for, fortunately, it was, well, unfortunately, it was really severe on our repository, but it wasn't as severe on our cultivar trial in the PQK orchard. Okay. But you still don't know your yield until you've collected it. Oh, I know. It says so, something interesting about this business, isn't it? Like you have to say, well, we see a lot of birds, but we don't know for sure. And, and yeah. Uh, then you open up the stores and everything. Right. Um, but we, we did sell out without any frost damage. We sold out of seed last year. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's fantastic. Just uh, two more quick questions. One is how, how do you see this, the chestnut improvement network looking 
in about 15 to 20 years? What, what do you, what's your crystal ball show you? Um, well, I would love to have um, a lot of stability on the second phase of the, the breeding program, the replicated trial phase. So right now we're focused on finding our footing and, and getting a nice base of germplasm out there now. So deploying seedlings for, for, you know, establishing breeding selection and but then in 15 to 20 years, we could have really nice data supporting selections from the material that's going out now and even have it propagated and well into the replicated trial phase across multiple environments. So that would be, if we were meeting what our expectations are from a breeding perspective, that's the phase we would be in in the breeding pipeline. So we would be starting to actually even near releases from the seedlings that are going out on farm now. Hopefully, well before we reach that 15 to 20 year mark, we make some strides in either, like any kind of clonal propagation strategy, whether it's micropropagation or in vitro approaches, or, or even just uh, grafting experiments that push us towards having more stable grafts. You know, that could be using older, older rootstock or, um, it could be maybe field grafting strategies. Um, there could be a number of those, but one of the aspects that might be interrupting uh, or increasing the, the failures in, in, in graft success could be establishment stress, which I think that Greg alluded to during his talk last month. But I think that there's promising outlooks for overcoming the, the clonal, some of the woes people have had with production of grafted plants too. Yeah, Hopefully fantastic. The case. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, chestnuts, chestnut trees are good for the planet, you know, the uh, food source that's going to be more and more available. And so I think that there should be more students studying agroforestry. And so what kind of tips would you give to someone thinking of a college career path? Yeah, so it's interesting, even from when I was in school to now, I think there's a lot more opportunities in agroforestry. There's a lot more capital coming to it, and then there's a lot of actual um, uh, established startups is maybe the way to put it now, where, you know, there's jobs. So yeah. it's it's nice you don't have to necessarily stay in academics, and you could explore different tangents uh, off agroforestry, like there's large-scale um reforestation companies globally now. Uh, and one of our recent master students, Ben Bishop, is, is now working for, for one of them. But I think like keeping doors open is the, the more general uh, sentiment I would, I would give folks and uh, getting a diversity of experience, um, like going into industry, um, maybe even before starting a graduate degree, getting, getting work experience, I think could be really valuable before going from a bachelor's to a master's or a master's to a PhD and seeing how like other entities are run or operated, you know, a, a grad student or um, especially a breeding program, uh, but like a, you know, a university lab is run in a, in a certain way, which isn't, isn't a business. It's more project-based and study-based and a lot of writing, uh, and I think that it's it's really helpful to go see how things operate in the in the real world for a while, where there's maybe more like shorter timelines uh, and, and deliverables, and and you don't have to write you know ten thousand words to get to the end of your project. So <laughs> I I think that those kind of experiences could be really valuable, uh, even if you know they want their career in agroforestry to ultimately come back to to academics. Yeah, because it, it's it is a bit interesting that uh, people like myself and my husband were are in the corporate environment coming to this, and by you know you just explained the the opposite. So there's a coming together, and that's a, another thing I feel in this industry. There are so much talent and experience from the people that are already in it, but also joining the industry just to leverage all of that together. Whether it's marketing and sales, or uh, or mechanical abilities and research. So it's good. Yeah, for us. It, it's it's a it's a new it's a new crop basically to to this part of the country. And we're probably trying to cultivate it in ways that haven't been done before in 
a lot of different areas that haven't had it cultivated in before. Like some some suitable, some you know less suitable. Um, and then there's this whole uh, value chain that is new, especially if we're uh, pursuing like non-traditional, you know, non-traditional folks from a chestnut perspective as as oh, the yeah. end end user. So from start to finish through the the value chain, everything is new, and so it is definitely going to take a lot of different uh, different backgrounds to make it grow and be successful. Absolutely. Do you have um, colleagues at other institutions or in, in, in other business organizations that you, you know, collaborate with or brainstorm with, or are you just out on an island? Um, I would say that we've, uh, we've established nice collaborations with a lot of folks in the, the chestnut community since we started, to, you know, three to four years ago. And it's also always helpful to information gather and and just hear where other people are at and and where they're where they're thinking, like the problems that they're working on, because they're they're different than our problems. Our problems are really specific, and they're about like establishing and build building out and securing these breeding programs. But then you know some we found found synergies in a lot of ways um, where we could be mutually supportive. Even though where we have different different goals, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, hey, thank you so much for your time. You probably need to get back outside. I would guess. It's possible. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. All right. Thanks a lot. Well, thanks a lot. Yeah, this was really fun to chat with you. Thanks for listening to Branching Out, hosted by United Chestnuts. For information about chestnut trees and chestnuts, visit unitedchestnuts.com. Subscribe to the weekly blog and join the United Chestnuts Community Facebook group. Let's grow together.